from Search for Social Change and Voice for Girls. We will be taking a session on gender awareness and how it impacts sustainable development goals. Uh, today, uh, we will be taking you through how gender plays a role in our lives, uh, in our day-to-day -day lives, and how it is related to SDGs. And uh, today's facilitators are Neonika, Anusha, and Vanita. I'll be introducing myself first. I am Neonika Roy. I work as the Senior Program Officer with Voice for Girls and Search for Social Change. I relate myself to a banyan tree. Uh, uh, like a banyan tree as it goes deep uh, into the soil and it takes a lot of time to grow. I believe that uh, my growth is a little slow pace. I take time like the banyan tree, but when I grow, I go into the depth or at least I would like to go into the depth. So my uh, soul tree has always been the banyan tree and I hope I can share and uh, sustain like a banyan tree for a long time. Uh, now we'll move on to our next facilitator, which is Ms. Vanita Prabhu. Uh, Vanita has been working with Voice for Girls and she is our operations manager. Vanita, would you please like to introduce yourself? Uh, hi everyone, I'm Vanita and I head operations at Voice for Girls. I've been in the development sector for more than 12 years now and I relate myself with the bouncing ball because I feel I'm very resilient to stress and when I am stressed out, I make myself back to the world more quickly and with smile stronger than before. And my like the bouncing ball, my thoughts are everywhere. And I think about solutions of how do we solve a certain issue which comes on our way. And it is really hard to break me. And I encourage criticism and I take feedback very positively. Thank you, Vanita. Thank you for sharing. Uh, we'll move on to our next facilitator, Ms. Anusha Bharadwaj. She is the Executive Director for Voice for Girls and the Founder Director for Search for Social Change. Anusha, please uh, say why do you relate yourself to this beautiful whale? Firstly, uh, I am Anusha. I am a development professional since 2002, a feminist and a mother. Uh, I derive my energy and passion uh, from working with girls and young women because uh, that's what I've been doing with Voice for Girls and Soch and through the past uh, decade and, uh, and a half. Uh, I believe that girls and women uh, widen circles of solidarity and I have made it my life mission to be inspired by their stories of bravery uh, and, and, uh, and, and beautiful uh, energy that they bring to this world. Uh, I would like to be a whale. I wish, uh, I think that would be my sole animal. I'm absolutely intrigued by the whale. Uh, they are the biggest creatures in the world and they, they absolutely uh, are still very mysterious and elegant. Uh, and what really inspires me from uh, their stories are, uh, they are matrifocal. So it is the female uh, members of the community that nurture and protect protect the whale community and I wish to inspire the world to embrace the same because I believe that's the future. Thanks, Renika. Thank you, Anusha. Thank you for sharing that. And with this, we come to the introduction of Voice for Girls, uh, of which all three of us are part of and is very close to us. So uh, Voice for Girls is a social enterprise that works with adolescent girls and boys in low-cost private schools and government schools of India. And we believe that each and every girl has the potential to be leaders in the community. And if given the right uh, knowledge on their health, safety, rights, future planning, and given life skills like advocacy and negotiation, they can uh, go a long way. They can take charge of their futures and bring change not only in their families, but also in their communities. And while working with girls, we realized that this vision of voice of where all the girls are equal and all the girls are enablers of change, we also need to work with other genders. And that's when we started working with boys through our Voice for Change program. These boys are there to be gender ambassadors and to be supporters to these girls and enable this vision of ours and create a better world. Vanita has been a part of Voice for a long time and there is no one else who's, who can better explain the reach of voice as well as what impact it has created in the society. Vanita, would you please say about the impact yes. and how your journey has been with voice? 
Uh, Voice for Girls started in 2011 and we started working in low income private schools and since then uh, Voice uh, scale, uh, scaled its operations to six states in India and now we have reached out to 85,000 adolescent girls and boys across these states and we believe that we will be able to reach out to 1 lakh adolescent girls and boys by end of 2021. Given the programs of Voice for Girls, uh, for the adolescent girls and the boys, we see that there has been an incredible change in the community. When uh, most often it is thought that the older people, experienced persons are required to bring change in the society. But given, but my experience with Voice has been that you could see a tremendous change that has been bought by a 13 to 14 year old girls in their own communities. With the knowledge and the information and the skills that's been given by Voice for Girls, the girls are able to stop marriages in their community, advocate for their rights, and also stand up for other girls as role models. And we've seen that now our adolescent boys have also become gender ambassadors in the community and have started supporting the adolescent girls. We believe that together, change is possible. Thank you, Manita. That was so true about voice. And while work to reach out to these uh, adolescent girls, we work with young women and men. And while we were working with these young women, we realized that women everywhere have potential to bring change. And that's how Soch happened. And Soch has been Anusha's baby. So there would be no other better person to talk about Soch and its inception. So Anusha, why don't you take over this? Uh, this so the word itself means a uh, new thought. And uh, I believe that if you have to change the world, you need a new direction and you need a new thought. Uh, and after working with 85,000 girls, I think uh, the answer was right there that girls and young women are the ones who are going to show the way for a better and sustainable world. And with SDGs, uh, which is the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, guiding the global platform and the work that is done in the development arena, uh, we said if we have to do, uh, uh, you know, reach uh, 2030 with some bit of development in all countries, global north as well as south, we really not need to start working with young women. And through our voice experience, we have realized that young women are willing to push the boundaries, are willing to go on into really unexplored areas and inspire other girls and young women to, to uh, get onto this path of change. And that's how Soch for Social Change happened. And through various programs, we work with young women and empower them to be future leaders. And uh, they, they transform not just themselves and other women and young girls like themselves, but also communities as a whole. Uh, we've reached out to almost 560 young women and they have in turn reached out to other women and almost 4,000 uh, adolescent girls. So I think the change just is, is widening and it's very inspiring for us to go on in, in this path. Thanks, Anusha. So just like uh, Voice and Soch believes that every woman and every man has the capacity to bring change, we are here to bring about some of our knowledge to you, our participants. All of you have been given a workbook and also set of worksheets which are from the workbook. So your first activity is to open up your worksheets and write a quirky introduction about yourself. Talk to us about how and why you relate to, relate to any animal or tree and what would you like to derive from it. We will do our first activity now, which is like a girl, like a boy. Uh, for this, you have been given a worksheet. So open your workbooks to worksheet one. You will find few words over there and two columns. One column calls like a girl. The other column is like a boy. You have to read these words and put them into these two columns. You can pause this video, take your time, write these words down, and then refer back to this video again. Now that you have written about what these words are uh, attribute to, if you have put them with them in like a boy or like a boy, a girl, refer and see if are there any words which you have put them down for both the columns. A lot of times the words that we have given you are categorized as masculine and feminine. So Anusha, what do you think about this masculinity and femininity? 
as you can see in the on the screen you can see this beautiful picture of this girl and a boy uh you can see that everything around this girl is is pink and i think the minute a girl is born or a boy is born in a hospital you can see that the girl gets everything pink from a pink crib to pink flowers to a pink balloon and the boy gets everything in blue uh we start slotting children based on the sexual organs that they are born with and uh, if it's a penis it's a boy if it's a vagina it's a girl uh, and and that's how they are socialized hence forth and again if you see this picture uh, nanika it's quite interesting that uh, all even through their journeys the girl is taught to be caring and gentle and and pretty she is looking very pretty in this picture but if you look at the boy you can see bravery you can see adventure you can see that he is opening his chest and willing to do something very brave and that's not easily something that you associate with a girl and that's how we are socialized to think so if you just go by masculine the words that automatically come to our mind is strong and powerful aggressive looking very physically strong and fit you have a beard you have a mustache you're sporty you're handsome but when we say feminine everything associated with feminine becomes pretty passive nurturing understanding gentle caring uh, and according to the, the classical definitions of masculine and feminine uh masculine means what culture says a man should behave and look like a man or a boy should behave and look like this includes their clothes their hairstyle their behavior their personality and like i said earlier there are things like strong and brave that you automatically associate with masculinity and feminine is what culture and society says a girl and a woman should behave like and look like again this includes clothes our hairstyle our behavior our personality and a lot of feminine qualities are spoken about as gentle and kind and nurturing so we are slotted and we start being cultured to think a certain way but let's look at this video uh, which will give you a very interesting perspective over to you nayanika now we are going to watch a video which uh, will show you that when girls and boys are not put into the bucket of like a girl and like a boy can actually behave differently this was a very powerful video which taught us that when like a girl is not associated with being weak people actually do things as they would do naturally but we are socialized and conditioned to act in a certain way from a very young age and the next video exactly talks about that this was our first activity and the first step to learn how gender plays a role in our day to day lives socialization can be done differently and you can learn about it by watching anusha's video we will also send you links for some study materials and we hope that this helps you thanks we will now move on to our next activity which is the gender bulb moment the gender bulb moment is the first time when you realize that there is something called gender that the world is actually divided between a man and a woman so i'll start with sharing about my gender gender bulb moment uh, it was somewhere around when i was 5 year old and my mom asked me to go out and get some curd from the shop and as i was walking on the road um it was right across my house it was not more than 10 steps and i thought i would be able to do it but i suddenly turned around and see my brother following me on the road when i came back home i was very upset and i asked my mom that why did you send him after me it is just like across the road and i could have easily gone and brought it and she said but uh, you cannot be uh, you cannot be left alone on the road you are a girl and uh, i remember i started questioning her to say that but you always let him go out of the house any time he wants and i don't get the same amount of freedom even if it is just uh, going stepping out of the house and playing for that matter and since then that's the first time actually i thought that okay there is some form of discrimination or there's some form of differential behavior towards me because i'm born a girl and that was just the starting point and which has stuck with me till now 
and i'm sure this has been a case with most of us and we'll see how it plays a role in our life so manita do you want to share some of your uh, gender bulb moment what was that first time when you were asked or you were told that you know you are a girl and there is a world which is divided between man and woman sure nayanika thank you uh, i think each one of us would have faced this uh, while we were growing up as a girl or a boy that you are expected to do certain things and you're not expected to do certain things because you're a boy or a girl i think my gender bulb moment was when i was in my class 9 uh most often i used to end up doing a lot of household chores at home helping my mom and i thought it was uh cool and i was trying to be a good girl because i am trying to help my mother whereas i see that my brother ended up going outside playing most often and uh, he uh, hardly did any household chores uh back then i didn't realize but later when um, uh, when i was 13 14 year old i started questioning my mother Uh, why is this? Why am I being asked to do all the household chores, whereas the brother is just let out to be the way he wants to be? Then my mother said, "Because you're a girl." And then it it I was shocked for a second because I wanted to know why. What difference does it make to do a household chore, whether you're a boy or a girl? But she said, "You know, when you get married, you need to go out to another house to live in. So you need to be well prepared for it." and that was another moment when i felt you know you are assigned certain task at home you are expected to behave in certain way because you are born a girl thank you for sharing that vanita i mean the the dialogue that you are a girl and you will go on to someone else's house and you will be expected to do these chores have been said to so many of us and thanks for bringing that out um anusha what about you what was your gender bulb moment when did you first uh, come across this so i was about 5 or 6 when i was playing house with a cousin brother and uh, for a change he said he's going to be the woman of the house so he was wearing uh, the clothes that a woman wears and he was cooking inside the kitchen and i was sitting reading a newspaper and i asked him to bring a cup of coffee for me my aunt my cousin brother's mother noticed that we were doing this and she was really upset so she came and said well you're the girl and you have to be in the kitchen making coffee and he he supposed to be sitting and asking you to bring and i was really shocked i was like i thought this was just a game but you know subconsciously i was playing out the gender roles that i see adults play and my aunt was really upset that her son is being socialized to play the role of a woman and i found that really uh, you know surprising and ever since then i started noticing what the men in the house were doing what the women in the house were doing and why it was different i was the only girl in the family where a lot of my cousins and my own brother so being the only girl i was always assigned the role of a girl whenever we would play games like this and i think that was the first time i started rebelling and understanding that the world was so segregated so i think my struggle and my revolt started like when i was 5 or 6 Thank you Anusha thank you for sharing that and uh, yeah like another example that we all have felt this from a very young age we all have been taught that how to behave like a girl and how to behave like a boy even from the times that we started understanding who we really are so now participants it's your turn you have been given a worksheet uh, to write down what is your gender bulb moment so think about that first time when you actually realized that the world is segregated between man and a woman and what was that incident which has still stuck with you pull out your worksheets and write down that thought now that you have found your gender bulb moment and written about that first experience when you thought that the world is actually divided into man and woman we have to realize that all of these things are dependent on socialization and our socialization also depends on the sex in which we are born in now let's move on to our next activity which talks about sex gender and gender expression as we understood in the previous activity understanding gender is very difficult but to this if we add sex gender and sexuality it is extremely complex So how do we begin to make sense of sex, gender and sexuality? For this, we use this really simple tool called the Gender Bread Person. It's a free online tool available, but we will use that to explain further sex, gender and sexuality. 
So let's begin by understanding gender, sex, and sexuality through this tool, which is a free online tool called the Gender Bread Person. Here, what we will be attempting to do is to understand be first with sex, then with gender identity, then with gender expression and attraction. So where do we begin? I think we'll begin with the first words that every boy or a girl's parents listen to when the child is born. It's a boy and it's a girl is how we are introduced to this world. That's because it is determined by the biological sex of the child, which is depending on the external genitalia of the baby, a sex is assign assigned to the child. It is indicated as female or male. However, according to some studies, there are up to one in 3000 babies who are born with ambiguous genitalia that doctors may find it difficult to immediately assign a sex at birth. Such babies are called intersex babies. And uh, this is a term that many countries are still grappling with. And recent survey shows that only seven countries in the world have a provision for babies to be registered as intersex. However, just because we are declared that we are a boy or a girl, do we actually become a man or a woman? No. This is where gender identity comes into play. We do not become one just because of the declaration. We are cultured and socialized to become a man or a woman. And when we learn these socialized uh, um, forms of behavior and actions, we learn it from many formal and informal institutions. For example, the family. In the family, we see adults play out gender roles and children automatically imbibe these values or even where mother or father actually teach their children or the parents teach their children that you are a boy, you have to dress like this. You are a girl, you are supposed to feel shy. So these are all these socializations that the family and the immediate group around the family will teach. The other place is where the peers play a big role. Again, it could be peers in your workspace, it could be peers in your school or college or institutions who play a big part in this. The school, I think that again is a really huge part where through textbooks, through even looking at the teachers and the adults in the school, children learn uh, their gender roles. Media is constantly bombarding us with information of how a man should look and what a woman should look like, how a man should behave and how a woman should behave. And the other major institution is religion. So gender expectations come in a very gender binary form in the world. And it is an extremely problematic as assumption that there are only two genders and that these are unchanging and distinct over time. It is high time that we break this gender binary of man, woman, male, female. And how does that one do that? And how do we understand that? A simple way to understand is when most people who are assigned female at birth identify as girls or women, and most men, uh, uh, most people who are assigned male at birth identify as boys or men, they are called cisgender. So, Saying this again, cisgender people have aligned to whatever their sex has been assigned as birth, at birth. However, not all identify as cisgender. Now imagine you are wearing a shirt, you're given a shirt and you're asked to wear it. And everybody thinks that the color and the pattern looks really good on you. Your family, your friends, everybody says this looks great and this is what you should be wearing. But it doesn't go with your personality and you feel very suffocated and you want to change. You want to not wear that. You would replace that with another dress that's your favorite or another shirt that's your favorite. That is how suffocated a person will feel when their sex and gender identity are not aligning. So what do you do? So people whose gender identity doesn't match the sex they were given at birth, that is, if they were born with a vulva or a vagina and uterus, but they identify as male, these people are called transgender or trans. 
Similarly, if they have a penis at birth, but they identify as woman, as female, a woman, these people are also called transgender or trans. In a gender binary world, being a trans person may be very confusing and complicated. Transgender people also face staggering levels of poverty, discrimination and violence. Only about eight countries across the world have um, legally recognized the third gender and uh, they have, which means that they have transgender people have more, have an equal footing to access opportunities and resources, at least on paper, at least legally. But what can you do? Creating inclusive public spaces, embracing gender neutral pronouns, recognizing and dealing with gender-based violence and provide, providing economic opportunities for transgender people can go a long way in reducing the discrimination faced by trans people. But now let's look at gender expression. All our socialization and how we identify ourselves is expressed to the outside world. And the outer world looks at how we are expressing our gender and make perceptions about who we are. So how does gender expression play out? So gender expression is how a person outwardly show their gender identity. It includes physical expressions such as a person's clothing, what they decide to wear. For instance, in a very traditional setup, a woman would wear clothes that women are assigned to, like frocks or dresses or sarees. Or men are expected to wear clothing like pants and shirts. It could also come in, di in, the, in the form of how we wear a hair. For instance, in India, women generally have long hair. They do not cut their hair short because it's supposed to be a sign of beauty for women. Another way is how we use makeup. Um, in a traditional setup like India, women are supposed to wear signs of marriage, are supposed to wear a dot on their forehead if they are married, if they are a Hindu person. So all of these are traditionally male. Uh, traditionally women, uh, how women would portray themselves. Or if you look at a man, he uh, it's considered in some uh, Indian states that men should sport a mustache to feel manly. An expression, how we use our hands, how we use our body language, that also conveys our gender expression. So it is slotted into, are you feminine or are you masculine? And these are the two words that may immediately come to your mind when I ask you to think of men and women. I wouldn't blame you. Many of us are told that men must be masculine and women must be feminine. So let's start by some of the traits that are considered traditionally masculine. So a masculine trait would be a dominant person, a strong and independent person, assertive, brave, a person who's innovative and adventurous. And some traits that are considered traditionally feminine are that, you know, being emotional, being nurturing, being vulnerable, being caring and humble are considered feminine traits. Traditionally, women were associated with feminine traits and men with masculine traits. In addition, the feminine traits are not considered very worthy. Whereas the masculine traits are supposed to also express confidence and bravery. Some people have the same gender expression all the time, while others may change their expression over time and based on circumstance. For instance, a woman can be very feminine at home, where the family and society perceive her as a giver and a nourisher, and be masculine at a workspace where she is perceived as assertive and dominating. So to build a more inclusive society, we must stop attributing worthiness to feminine or masculine traits and imbibe a culture where we believe that gender expression is unique to each person. This brings me to the last aspect of the gender-bred person, which is attraction. Sexuality is about your sexual feelings, thoughts, attractions, and behaviors towards other people. 
you can find other people physically sexually or emotionally attractive and all those things are part of your sexuality people attracted to the opposite sex are called heterosexual while some people are attracted to the same sex such people are called homosexuals some people are attracted to both people of the opposite sex as well as the same sex such people are called bisexual there are many terms that are used to describe sexuality like straight gay lesbian bisexual pansexual etc the lgbtqia+ it's a it's a term that use that is used to de de denote gender and sexuality i would suggest that you take time researching about each of this the language and vocabulary around this is constantly changing and we need to adapt to these so that we are able to create a more gender inclusive society now each of these elements that we described the the sex the gender identity gender expression and sexuality is always as you can notice in this slide is on a spectrum we urge you to look at your worksheet and identify where on the spectrum you lie always remember that whatever you feel is what you personally feel and only you would know that and at the same time all of these indicators can change over a period there is no one gender bred person for a person um, and it could change through time so i hope you enjoyed this and do look up the gender bred person website to uh, get more details and uh, and i hope you have a fun time exploring the concept of sex gender and sexuality thank you so this brings us to our next activity uh, as we saw in the previous activities that there are several identities that we each of us have and we saw gender and sexuality as one kind of identity however there are several factors that determine who we are and our stories and our journeys and some of these intersectionalities could be your race the race you belong to the country you belong to the class uh, or your sexuality and and each of these identities can arise out of privilege and each of these identities can also give certain groups more power in the society so to understand power and privilege and how dominant we feel in our society or we don't feel in our society we are going to use this uh, tool called the power flower tool so before we understand that let's just get down to some brass basics of what is power and what is privilege so uh, nayanika can you help us here so uh, power is the ability to have position of control authority or influence over others for example if you are a man uh, in most of the families men make the financial decisions of the family so men hold that financial power in the family whereas privilege is a special right immunity or advantage which is given to certain group of people so if you are a heterosexual person you have the privilege in the society because you are more accepted in the society based on this power and privilege there are certain dominant groups which are created and anusha is going to explain you more about these dominant categories and groups based on the power flower so if you see in this tool that you uh, also see on the screen and your worksheet we see two sets of petals there is an inner set of petals which is in the yellow color and the outer set of petals which are in a purple color the outer petals are the dominant category so how we determine the outer petals or the dominant category is based on each of these identities that have been placed in front of you for instance age race gender sexual orientation class education ability religion a few of the categories we have marked out here so how do we determine what goes as a dominant category so if we were not doing a socially distant version of this workshop and we were in a classroom maybe we would do this as a group but if our worlds are so far apart i am i am from india and you are from some other part of the world your dominant categories can be very different from what my dominant categories are 
but because we are doing a socially distance wash distant version right now i want you to think about who you would place in the dominant group so you could take this decision based on your national metrics what what are the identities that are most dominant in your country based on statistics or you could do this based on where you think your community is your immediate community is so for this uh, the, the purpose of understanding this further i want you to think about what this dominant category is the the different identities that have been placed in this is just an example you could add more in the dominant category of your particular uh, community or your nation so this is not a fixed category of uh, identities that we presented you can add few more in your outer petals now after you have identified the dominant categories in each of this for instance let's take an example of race we can say that in race if you're white you're dominant so you place yourself and make the dominant categories for each of these out identities on your outer petal now coming to the inner petal is how you would relate yourself to the social dominant category so if you have marked in race that being white is socially a dominant group and you are from the white race then you will mark yourself in alignment with the outer petal so your inner petal and outer petal are aligned if it is aligned i would urge you to color it with green and if it is not aligned that means your social dominant category and your who, who what you identify yourself are not aligned please color that inner petal with red so i would urge you to pause after we finish sharing our power flower with each of you to do this for yourself so just to explain this a little uh, uh, further i'd like to present to you what i feel is my power flower uh, if you take education um, in my country i believe that the dominant group would be those who are very highly literate and uh, coming from a country like india where uh, i think half the girls don't even pass the standard 10th i have a double masters degree so i would say i fall under the dominant category in education uh, i am a mentally and physically able, able bodied person so in ability also i dominate in india the religion that's dominant is hinduism and though i'm not a very practicing hindu but my name and the way i behave suggests that i'm a hindu so i would be considered under the dominant category and uh, like most places in the world uh, the economic productive age group is where i belong so i believe i am dominant even in the age category i am a heterosexual person and that is easily accepted by most society so in my society as well i would fall under the dominant category in the sexual orientation but if you look at race i have been to many global for, for, fora and i believe that the white race is the one that is more dominant as a person of color i wouldn't consider myself in that dominant category and in class uh, india is a place where the haves that have not have a wide spe spectrum so uh, just to understand i would say i'm not in the upper class of the society i would call myself still middle class so i placed myself in the not dominant category and gender being a woman especially in a developing country like india where it's extremely patriarchal i do believe that i am at a disadvantage so this is my power flower so i am uh, passing on the ba baton to nayanika to share hers so i'm now going to describe uh, my power flower and where i place myself uh in relation to the dominant categories i'll start with class uh i do not feel that i am in the dominant category in the class uh in the economic spectrum because sometimes i have to be dependent on someone else for economic needs uh, for example my parents and i don't find myself completely independent over there race uh, being a brown person i don't think in a world strata in a on a larger platform i am in the dominant category sexual orientation yes being a heterosexual uh, i have certain power and privilege in the society and hence i would place myself in the dominant category there 
uh, when it comes to age again uh, i don't think i'm still in the decision making age group category i still have to be dependent on other people and like my parents would still make certain decisions for me uh when it comes to religion since i stay in india and hinduism is a dominant uh, religion in india and i follow hinduism it uh, automatically gives me certain amount of power and privilege in the society i am an able bodied person and which uh, provides me with a lot of privilege to do a lot of tasks independently and then hence i am in a dominant category there uh i have a masters degree and if i see on a larger spectrum a lot of girls do not get education they are not as uh, privileged as me i can if i can put it in that way and hence i have marked it green coming to gender being a woman um i still feel that there's a long way to equality and i'm still not there and hence uh, i have marked it as red so out of 8 petals i have given myself a 4 out of 8 score over here and on a larger uh, spectrum of being dominant or not i am somewhere there so it's a 50 50% chance for me uh, we now move on to vanita and let's see what her uh, power plot talks about her um thank you nayonika i would like to share my power flower and i would like to start with gender gender in a dominant uh, society like india i would say that uh, women are quite often discriminated whether it at home or in the society so i don't uh, feel being a woman is a privilege uh, in a country like india uh, when it comes to class i feel in uh, i i belong i consider this as a privilege because during the times of covid i am able to afford insurance for my family i am able to earn for my family and i am also able to um, uh, sustain uh, myself and my family so i feel that i am privileged uh, i am in the privileged class uh, being a brown person uh, i don't think it is a privilege uh, and i am an heterosexual and most often in again in india coming to the indian context i think being a heterosexual you are a privileged and you are in the dominant group and at this age in the age bracket of 30 to 35 i feel that you have uh, uh, there is more opportunity to be independent and make decisions for yourself so i feel that it is a privilege um, uh, being in this particular age group and uh, i belong to hindu religion and most uh, mostly in india 80% of them belong to hindu category so following hinduism is one of the privileged category again i am a uh, abled person physically and mentally so i would again rate myself in the privileged group and in terms of education coming from a dis- uh, society where women are often discriminated girls do- drop out from the schools i have my masters degree so i feel this is a privilege for me so in the power flower of the eight i would say i would have scored 6 thank you vanita uh, as all of you could see that uh, i had a score of 5 out of 8 Vanita had a score of six out of eight. Nayanika scored herself four out of eight. So though we belong to the same country and we would uh, we work in the same organization, we each have our own reasons why we are in a social dominant group or not in a social dominant group. So here we urge you as participants to really think about what are the social dominant groups in the context you are in, and place yourself. this will give you a really good understanding of resources that are allocated to you and other people who are not in the social dominant category and uh, it, it could be the beginning of how do we look at these resources access to these resources and opportunities and how can it be redistributed so that the most marginalized groups in our society can benefit from it thank you So in today's session we learned about how gender plays a role in our lives and uh, gender is present everywhere even in the last activity where we were discussing about power and privilege we saw that if you have certain amount uh, or if you belong to a dominant category of the gender you have certain amount of privilege in the society which will help you to go forward and uh, to say that women form 50% uh, population of the world it means that we have that amount of potential to contribute to the global arenas we are still not equal to men 
and if women are not there it means the other genders take two steps back so if you just look into few of these areas like political representation or economic status health care or education we will see that women are not yet in parity with men uh, which forms gender discrimination in the society and to meet this discrimination 152 countries came together to form the sustainable development goals uh, to understand gender and uh, gender stereotypes and discrimination on a global front, it is important to look at the SDGs. So the Sustainable Development Goals were set up or uh, they are the blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. And uh, it was set up to address some global challenges like inequality, environmental degradation, climate change, peace and justice, but one of this that stood out was SDG 5, which caters to gender equality. So gender equality was set up to ensure that women and girls uh, uh, receive equal opportunities as men. And it was recognized to be necessary to form a peaceful, prosperous and a sustainable world. We have come a long way forward, but we still need to move. Uh, we still need to take a few steps more. To understand where do we stand right now, uh, let's see some of the statistics related to gender parity and I would request Juanita to take it forward. Uh, like Nayonika had mentioned that gender inequality has become a global problem because of which we were not able to attain social progress. And when we look at the statistics, you will find that there are more number of young women and girls who are married when they are below the age of 18. And if you look at the economic participation of the women or girls, it's only 28% at the managerial positions. And this is a very small increase in the percentage when we compare it with the previous years again. And when you look at the political participation of the women, it is not more than 25%, whether it is at the lower houses of the national parliament. So when we look at these statistics, it clearly shows us that men, women and girls are more vulnerable and are discriminated across at different spheres, whether it is at home, school or community. The report, the gender gap report published by World Economic Forum shows that it will take 99.5 years to reach the gender uh, gap that exists in the country. And we have seen here is the list of 10 top 10 countries which are striving to attain gender equality in their own countries, they, which is uh, on the top, you can see Island, Iceland and then which is followed by Norway, Finland and Sweden. And if countries like US are still in the 53rd position and uh, China is in 106th position, this shows us that there is a huge gap that exists in uh, whether it is in terms of economic participation uh, or a uh, political participation or education attainment or health survival and this has to be addressed at both individual household level family level as well as societal level nayonika would you like to share an example of at the home what do you think they could do Yes, Vanita. So, um, as Vanita was speaking, that apart from these, uh, the gender gap that we can see on a global level, first we need to break it down to see how it exists within uh, our surroundings. So, one very quick uh, short example that came to my mind. Um, so, when at home, uh, both of my parents are, were working and uh, my mother still used to come back from uh, work and do all the household chores. So even when she was taking up a work which was uh, where she had to step outside the house, the gender stereotype or the gender role that she, a woman needs to work all the household chores or needs to complete all the household chores still lied on her. So if we see in terms of an equal world or an equal community, we would, uh, uh, what we would do is divide the household chores and work it within the family members. But this was not something which was seen uh, in my house and I'm sure which is not seen in most of the households uh, which is uh, present. But apart from home, of course, um, we can understand gender roles and gender stereotypes in schools and community which actually lead on to a gender parity. And Vanita, why don't you talk about some of these uh, gender discriminations that we see in school and community? 
Uh, sure, Nayanika. Before I could move on to about talking about gender parity at school or at uh, communities, I would urge the participants to think about the gender roles that they observe at their own homes. Uh, please take a second to pause and think about the gender roles that you observe at your homes. Moving on, uh, like Nayanika had given an example about home, at school most often uh, we see, ex for instance in India, we see that the enrollment rate of the girls and the boys in the primary grades, that is from class 1 to 5, is high, is almost equal, but when you look at the secondary grades, that is from 6th to the 10th, uh, the enrollment numbers of the girls are reduced by half. This is because of the, as soon as the girl hits the puberty, she is expected to stay back at home and she is not expected to go to the school and which which affects her further career options that are available to her as well. Similarly, at community, when we talk about teachers or when we talk about nurses, the common instance that comes to our mind is that these are women and we do not think of men doing these roles as teachers or nurses. Similarly, when we talk about pilots, doctors or engineers, we think uh, only men are, uh, we relate immediately with the men. So, so when we're talking about uh, all of this from an Indian context, uh, we would also like you to think about how gender roles uh, exist in your home, school and community uh, from your perspective and dwell a little more on it. Uh, we would also want you to watch this amazing video, which uh, actually shows how children uh, develop the idea of gender roles and gender stereotypes from a very young age. So the video link is provided in your workbook. Uh, we would want you to pause uh, this uh, video right now and go and watch uh, the video on gender disparity and come back to this. I hope you will. You all would have watched the video. Uh, the, as you would have understood from the statistics that the discrimination at the home or the so schools or the society leads to further gender gap in the communities. And now what we would urge all the participants is kindly look at your national level indicators, that is the economic participation of women, um, political participation and the education levels as well as the health outcomes. When you look at, please look at if you, if all both men and both girls and boys have equal access to education. So participants here is an interesting activity for you. Uh, you can also refer to your worksheets for this. Uh, we urge you to think how you're going to act in these four areas. First one is how would you act to end all forms of violence against women? And when we say all forms of violence against women, it can be violence at home, school, community, workplace. Um, think about what are these violence and think what is the step that you can take in order to bring a change. The second one is to recognize and value the work done by women at home. Uh, like I said, my parents uh, were working and my mother used to go out, but still come in, uh, come in, uh, come at home and work. Um, during the COVID-19 phase, we are seeing that a lot of household chores is getting, uh, done, is on women to do, and it is acting as an extra burden for women. So how do you think we can recognize this unpaid labor, which is done by women at home and how we can value that? Your third uh, activity will be to encourage women and girls to participate in all forms of economic, uh, political and public spheres and think about how you can do that. Lastly, uh, think about the equal rights under your law. So think about the rights that your country has and uh, find out the rights which actually promote equality. I hope you had fun exploring all of these concepts with us as much as we had in putting this together for you. And I hope that this is just the beginning of the conversation and you are able to take this information and use it to understand the outside world and in relation to the outside world. So we also shared a lot of worksheets and materials which you can continue to use 
to interact with other people to share this information. We would also uh, be sharing a Google form with some feedback or any question that you may want to ask us further. With this, for, from Vanita, Nayonika and me at Voice for Girls India, thank you very much. And I hope you have the rest of this workshop as a super success. Thank you so much.